grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text before us this morning, the well-known Beatitudes of the Lord that begins his Sermon on the Mount from Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 and following. So, now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for the same way they persecuted the prophets who were sent before you. This is God's word. Dear friends in Christ, as the Lord began his ministry after choosing his disciples and, and calling them to follow him, crowds were starting to come out to him. They heard of him and they wanted to hear him. And as he saw the crowds coming, he went up onto the side of a mountain. And there he began to teach his disciples. We don't know fully if it was just his disciples that heard this sermon or if others came along as he was preaching. But nevertheless, he had a very real purpose for this sermon. The thought of Jesus coming was joy to the people because they thought, now we can reestablish the kingdom of God here on earth and we can get rid of this dreaded Roman tyranny that we are living under. We can reestablish things the way they were and used to be and Jesus will be this king and so on. And Jesus dispelled this notion right off the bat. And even though the people didn't fully understand what he was saying to them, yet the message was very clear. You see in the first beatitude and the last beatitude where he says, For such is the kingdom of God. One of the things that we learn as Christians is that the kingdom of the world is much different than the kingdom of God. We don't do things the way the world does things. Oh, we pick up a lot of their bad habits and a lot of their traits and a lot of their, their interests and such like that. And we try to bring about happiness in our lives by doing the things that the world does. We get brought into this thinking that if you have a lot of things, you can be happy and you can do things the way you want. You'll be happy and you'll have so much enjoyment in life. And the Lord says, those things don't bring lasting pleasure. They don't bring great joy. I had the thought of the day, the other day, the, the Greek word translated here, blessed, is also translated happy. Happy are they who are persecuted. Happy are those who mourn. Happy are those who are poor in spirit. And we look at that and we shake our head and we say, that's not my idea of happiness. And that's true. Jesus did not begin his Sermon on the Mount by saying, Blessed, happy are they who make lots of money. Happy are those who enjoy power, prestige, fame, honor. Happy are those who just have such perfect health all their lives and never really have any setbacks and any struggles with one infirmity after another, or that type of thing. See, see, that's the kingdom of the world. And the Lord is explaining to us the kingdom of heaven. None of these things come naturally. They're foreign to us. You cannot be happy if you're persecuted. You cannot be happy if you're meek. The meek get run over. You have to be bold, you have to be aggressive, you have to grab for things in life, you have to, you have to make it your own. To humble ourselves, to be meek, doesn't make sense. The other thing, as this morning we're not going to go into each of the Beatitudes, there's not enough time for that. But 
but we would do a general overview of the whole Sermon on the Mount. And it is something that has been studied and has been looked at. Um, the axioms of, of all the things that are said here have been repeated and become little sentences that we put on a refrigerator about, you know, what is joy and happiness in life. The Sermon on the Mount is, for the most part, all law. That there is really little gospel in the Sermon on the Mount. And when I say gospel, there is no, this is what you do to be saved. This is what brings about salvation. Because that's not what's spoken of here. And we begin to understand that as we grow in our Christian faith. There's a number of things in catechism class I always have a difficult time trying to impress upon and to, to how to, to teach some particular aspect of the Christian faith. One of which is when we come to faith, there is a new creation within us. You know, what is that new creation? How do you explain this new creation? Well, you, you can't explain it as some momentary thing. It's not like some, some light has dawned and some new revelation has come and all of a sudden I'm a different person. You are, but not in the ways you think. That new creation is a, a, a progression in our life, a process in our life. We we'll begin to understand what the Lord is saying by this. None of these beatitudes are we, are we able to do on our own. You can say, well, I'm a meek person. If you're saying you're a meek person, you probably aren't a meek person. Oh, I'm a humble person. I, 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 I'm a really humble person. I, I, just, I do all these things. If you're saying it, you probably aren't. Oh, I enjoy being persecuted for the Lord. No, you don't. You dread it. You despise it. You get angry at God for allowing you to have to go through this abuse and, and such. And so we, we fight against that. But the Lord is very clearly saying, this is the Christian life. It's not the life of the world. It's the life of faith that God gives you. And then we slowly begin to understand. As you look at the Beatitudes, there's eight of them. And you look at each of these, you know, it's easy for people to say, if I can do all those, then God will love me and I'll be saved and I'll be in heaven. So we strive really hard to be a meek person and to appreciate what's going on. And, and we find that this, we fail miserably. See, these are gifts that God gives to us. As we look at the Beatitudes, it's not a matter if I do all these things, then I will be saved. It's I am saved, and now that faith that God has given me enables me and helps me to be all of these things. And that's the huge difference. That's the kingdom of God compared to the kingdom of this world. And we don't understand it. And Probably the disciples didn't understand it at that time either. What are you talking about? We know that many people will just turn away from the Lord and stop following him because these teachings are too hard or too difficult to understand. Because we're trying to use our reasoning. We're trying to make sense of them by thinking of what I am doing and how this, rather than seeing what God is doing in me. That transformation that is taking place in our lives. Two good examples from Scripture. The Pharisee and the publican. The Pharisee comes into the temple and I'm not a bad guy. I tithe and do even more than tithe. I pray regularly. I do all these things. Now that person over there that person needs some work. And I'm, I'm thankful I'm not like him, Lord. Such pride, such arrogance. The publican, on the other hand, I'm not worthy to come into your temple. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. The change that takes place in one's heart as we begin to appreciate what the Lord has done for me. You see, too often in life, we want to compare ourselves with other people. 
Don't do that. Compare yourself with God. And you find yourself woefully missing the mark. You find yourself humiliated at my simple little righteous deeds that I think are gaining his pleasure are worthless in his sight because I am so filled with sin. When we get to realize that each day, it magnifies in our eyes the sacrifice that the Lord has made for us. And it humbles us. And all of a sudden, we realize that this particular instant, this particular affliction, this particular accident, this particular event has really caused me to see myself for what I am. I am pretty helpless on my own. I am pretty helpless to do things that I want to do. And with that humbling comes about meekness. It brings about the idea of, of mourning and of, of being poor in spirit. And the Lord has brought that realization onto me. And the Lord lifts us up and says, Blessed are you. Blessed are you in my sight. Because the kingdom of God is yours. The other example is that of the prodigal son. And actually this sermon in a couple weeks will be on the prodigal son, so we don't want to rob too much from that Sunday. What about the prodigal son? Father, give me my share of the inheritance. I am not going to be a slave around here anymore for you, wasting my life here when I can be out there and I can have the world by the tail. I can do all these wonderful things, so give me my money. I went out. And he did. And he went out. And how did that work out for him? He thought he had all the answers. He thought he knew exactly what to do. Life wasn't complicated for him. Just have a little extra money. I can do a lot of things. And boy, what fun I'll have. And boy, I'm sure he had a little fun there for a while. Until all of a sudden the money ran off. And the realization of what he had done. How he had been so arrogant, how he had so despised his father, how he had no love for his father, for his family. It was all about me. And all of a sudden, the realization came crashing down on him. And he said, I will go back to my father, but I will not go back as a son because I have proven myself to be unworthy to be his son. I will go back and I will ask him to treat me like he does one of the hired servants. What took place? Did all of a sudden he say, say to himself, ah, I decide I'll be a meek person from now on. Ah, I decide I'll be a humble person. Oh, I decide that I'll be poor in spirit for a while. No. It was something that through the course of, the, of his life now, the Lord was working in him. And no doubt in his home he had been taught about his God. He had been taught about the mercy of his, of his God. And he came back. And he understood what it meant to be poor in spirit. Father, I have nothing to offer you. Father, in your mercy, you know, may I stay in one of the servants' places. Do the servant's work. And the father takes him and puts on the robe and, and treats him like a son, the lost son who had come back. So how do you teach when you become a believer, when faith enters your life and you become a new creation? When does it begin to dawn upon us that every step of the way the Lord has been doing things to humble to make me realize how poor in my own abilities, in my own ways. And the Lord does that. As you look at the, the Beatitudes, it, it's kind of a progression. It starts off with the very first one, to be poor in spirit. When we lay ourselves out before the Lord, 
and to say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, forgive me for my sins. Whether or not Luther said these exact words, but um, it was in the movie, so maybe he did say them. Luther was, the night before he had to make his testimony at the Diet of Augsburg, or, or Diet of Worms, excuse me, um, he, was, he was prostrate on the ground, and he just kept on repeating, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And one could envision Martin Luther doing that. It was just a realization that what was about to happen the next day, it was totally out of his control. And so how does he start his prayer to God? Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. He had no idea what the next day would bring. Would it bring about his death? Would he be declared a heretic? Would he be executed? Which would have went along with that, of course. He knew nothing. But yet, he was taught how one is poor in spirit. And from that would grow all the other graces. See, none of these things are things we can do on our own. It is the power of the Holy Spirit working through word and sacrament in our lives that fills us with the understanding that this truly is riches in the eyes of God. This truly is happiness. To know that the Lord is mine. He died for me. Salvation is sure. And that brings about the peace that has some understanding. Because it is something that God gives to me. And so as we look at the Sermon on the Mount, we see all these things. The Lord is preaching to the believer here. This is who you are. And over the course of our lives, we slowly but surely begin to understand those concepts. And we show them in our lives. Not because it's me doing it and look at me, but rather it's look what the Lord has done in me. And look at the change that has taken place. And so we see that the things of this world and things of God are different. We don't abstain from the world. We don't try to get out of the world. We aren't people that want to shelter ourselves in a cave. But we realize that our calling as Christians are different. We have different goals, different desires. We have a love for people. We have a love for people, and we want them to know Jesus as well. We want them to know that Jesus suffered and died to pay for their sins. And that's true joy when we are able to, to tell someone what good things God has done, regardless of what their attitude might be or with this, in, in that regard, but still the joy of being able to serve. Because the Lord is homeless. He's made us meek, but all the while promising, because for those belong the kingdom of heaven. We have God's blessing. He sent his son to die for us. That empowers us. That brings changes in our lives. Changes of attitude. The law given on Mount Sinai for the most part spoke to the outward actions. The law that is given in the Sermon on the Mount speaks to the heart, the internal attitude. The internal attitude about all the things that we do. Because it's out of the heart that proceeds all the evil thoughts and sins and such like that. And so this speaks to our hearts. And the Lord says, this is how you will be happy. And as time goes along, we realize you are absolutely right. Thank you, Lord, for filling my heart with these attitudes and with these desires that I might always serve you. Amen.